Welcome to season three of Under the Sisterhood, Women Making the World Healthier. Our conversations will focus on the themes of women's health and wellness with a new episode every Friday until the end of the year. We will discuss topics ranging from sexual health to mental health while learning from the accomplished practitioners who make women's health care possible. This is a podcast to celebrate women and all they do in our world. I'm Elizabeth Elfenbein. Let's get under the hood. Today, we're getting under the hood of Met Diber, a mother, daughter, sister, friend, women's advocate, and the CEO and founder of MyMe, a leader in personalized trials and care for autoimmune non-responders, as well a serial entrepreneur with over 20 years of experience in startups and building businesses. Met's lifelong journey with autoimmune disease started at age 14 and included managing several diagnoses such as psoriatic arthritis and sojourn syndrome. After testing the best that modern medicine had to offer and hearing from experts that there is nothing more we can do, she decided to take her health into her own hands. An economist by training, Met began collecting and analyzing her own data until she could directly correlate her symptoms to external factors in the exposome that were triggering her flares. 16 months later, Met was able to reduce her symptoms, successfully bringing her into remission to improve her quality of life. In 2013, she filed her first patent, now cited by companies like Apple, and officially began the journey to help others with uncontrolled autoimmune disease flares, ultimately founding MyMe in 2017. Today, MyMe is transforming autoimmune care for people with debilitating autoimmune symptoms who experience poor quality of life due to an inadequate response to medication. As a recognized authority on autoimmune disease and digital health, Met speaks at regularly on rethinking the standard of care for autoimmune non-responders through data-driven personalized trials and care. She has appeared at events like Stanford Medicine X, Exponential Medicine, and CureX, and is a frequent guest on health industry podcasts. MyMe has been recognized by the Gallian Foundation, the American College of Rheumatology, the Institute, of Functional Medicine and Fast Company. In 2022, MET received the Health 2.0 Outstanding Leadership Award. This year, MET received the Springboard Inaugural Rising Star Award. MET holds a master's in economics from Our House University, UCLA, and is a certified health coach. Wow, welcome, MET. Thank you so much for having me, Elizabeth. That's a mouthful. (laughs) <laughs> it is. What a wonderful. I'm so excited to dig deeper and get under the hood with you. Um, It's season three, and it's all about women making the world healthier. And the work you're doing is fascinating. So if it's okay, I would love to get going. Amazing. Well, I am big on women and I'm big on health for women. I think uh, a new mother myself, we've I've talked about the strain on women for years, but I've now also felt it, right? And there is something about women being caregivers, first and foremost, to the ones around us in terms of our husbands and our children, but also just people that you meet on your way. And I think um, it's no coincidence that a lot of times women are the ones that get bogged down by diseases like autoimmune disease because it's, you know, determined by your immune system gets quote unquote confused and attacked itself but it's almost like that water glass that you know the last drop makes it overflow and um, a, a dear friend of mine said yesterday and I laughed so hard she said it's so funny because I just saw my husband's um, sort of like list to himself for Christmas and it said buy a gift for her name and she goes my list has like 750 things I have to remember and so I think a lot of times um, autoimmune disease sets its place in just the overwhelming amount of things we try and do, and not just do, but do at 110%. And so, you know, the list was long of all the accolades of what we all do, but I think it's not it's not very different for most women. We all try and do our very best on every every single day. And so does that mean that we are healthy? I think a lot of times when I meet people on my way that are doing it all, you know, green juices before 
before 6 a.m. and off to the gym and all these things on top, I sometimes wonder, yes, on paper, it's healthy, but sometimes what is health? Like, how do we evaluate it? And having gone through my own journey, it's been very clear that health can be many, many different things. And so um, I think I just wanted to put that out there as a, as a starter. Um, before we sort of dig into to what does it look like to be me and and a lot of times I get sort of this I don't know if it's intended the way that it feels but sometimes it's like but of course you've always just done whatever you needed to do to get shit done so of course you could just like reverse your own autoimmune disease and and my pushback is well I was in the system for 20 years medicated like the next person and going from doctor to doctor, being told that it was all in my head, right? And so I think it's when when we write stories, or as I say, rewrite stories, oftentimes winners come out as if they had set a plan from the beginning and just executed on it. I don't think that there's ever such a thing. I was a very disempowered patient in the system. And one day I had enough. And in the moment when I decided that I wasn't going back and that the messages that I had been, you know, given by my, my doctor's team was not sufficient for me to believe that there was ever going to be a good path for me, I became an empowered human being. Not uh, that that equals me creating a solution. I got lucky that the, the span of my life and all the things that I had done and the way that my brain works and patterns and stuff like that all culminated in me being able to reverse my disease symptoms and normalize my blood work. But um, I just am always very wary of how we tell stories because I think if you tell people that you have to be a winner to win, then most people, especially women, decide that I'm probably not that. So let me sit back. I think one of the most important parts is to make sure that everybody understands that winners are made as a part of the process and, and the conviction, not so much um, in the outset. It's interesting. You said it's not like there was a grand plan to get here. It's like things happened in your life and you had to discover and find your voice in your life, in your body, in your way. And so if it's okay, I'd love to go back and understand at 14, you were diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. If you could tell us a little bit about that journey, because I, I forget what age, I know you shared it with me in our prep meeting at that age in which you said, I'm gonna become the empowered uh, person, no longer a patient, I'm gonna take things into my own hands. I would love for you to share with the audience the journey from age 14 to when you had that aha moment, this is it. At 14, the day of confirmation, I grew up in Denmark, so a Christian country, the day of my confirmation, I had two little red spots on my neck. And the only reason we even noticed it was because it's the only day, you know, you wear all white. And so two days later, I woke up and I just had some like these little, little red dots all over my body. So I basically had psoriasis head to toe. And as you can imagine, there's nothing worse for a 14 year old girl than all of a sudden waking up with this thing. And also you, you don't know whether it's ever going to go away or whether this is how you live with. So, so the, the, the mental trauma of, of hiding it. And my dad still tells the story about how funny it was that we were in Greece and I brought two suitcases and I changed clothes three times a day. And it was only this year. So, you know, I don't know. 30 plus years later that I said to him, dad, by the way, when you tell that story, you take me straight back to a place that was really awful because I was trying to hide the fact that I had this, you know, head to toe. And he goes, oh, I just thought it was sort of like a cute thing. And I was like, no, I know you do. That's why I've been letting you tell the story. But it wasn't because I was a fashionista. It was because I was basically not in a swimsuit like the rest of the world and I was trying to hide it the best I could and so that's where it started my teenage years I didn't have any diagnoses but there was definitely something wrong I couldn't drink alcohol like others I couldn't do a lot of normal stuff just because my system just wouldn't allow it 
And then in my early 20s, it became abundantly clear that something was really off. And now sort of the the medical journey started uh, going from doctor to doctor. And a lot of times also a lot of hokey sort of alternative things, because when you get told by your doctor that it's all in your head and you feel like there's an enormous delta between what you used to know as you and how you feel on a daily basis, you're willing to do anything. So we've definitely gone through um, through, through both journeys in the, in the standards healthcare system and, and outside of it. And then at, how old was I, 23, um, you know, standard cell check ended up in, um, in, um, in cancer cells and then the treatment and, and the, the journey from there really landed me in um, sort of like a catapult. Uh, and I think that's always how it works, right? You get, you get sick and unless you figure out what's the root cause, then one sickness leads to the next. So I collected another five diagnoses in my last, my, my end twenties. And so came in to my thirties with six diagnoses on an enormous amount of medication, giving myself biologics injections on a weekly basis and so forth. Um, but more so than anything had now really taken on this sort of jacket of chronic patient. Like I was at the hospital getting, you know, EKGs on a weekly basis. And like, there was a lot of things that sort of comes with being a patient. And when you have six diagnoses, you also have six specialty teams. And like, there's just a lot of stuff that comes with the territory. And so you sort of get lulled. I, I use that word because it sort of feels like it puts your senses to sleep and so when I talk about my wake-up call it was um one of my many doctors that called and said they had great news and then upon arriving at the hospital they proceeded to tell me that I wasn't going to die in the quote-unquote immediate future and at the time I was so naive that I said well that's great what is the good news and then it got exceedingly awkward because they thought of this as a good piece of information. And at the time I asked them, what are, what are we going to do about my process? To which the answer was, we're happy with your numbers. And I'm kind of grateful because, sorry, I'm kind of grateful because as an economist, happy with my numbers was not one of them. And I think they could have told me an abundance of things that would have had me come back. But for me, that was the end of the line. I was like, no. And so called my parents and said, I'm not going back. And that was sort of the turning point for me. And, and I'm sorry, and I'm sorry to have interjected, but was that all happening no, of course. in Denmark or the US at that point? I moved to the US was I when I was 23. So, so you- I had my my first couple of years, like three or four years um, in Denmark. And then right before I turned 24, I moved to the US. Wow. So this is, it's so interesting. Um, that, I mean, it's so interesting, those inflection moments. So, so just hearing, hearing your doctors come in and say, yeah, we're happy with your numbers and you being an economist, like yeah, it's such an interesting wake up call. So, so you hear that comment and what was your immediate like response in terms of, you said you woke up, but then what did you do? Like what, how did you, journey then take on a new chapter if you will I right then and there knew I had to gain control like I I I think the best way to explain it was it felt like I had always sort of handed the reins to somebody else and that moment I took it back I took back sort of ownership and so little did I know that I was going to actually be able to help myself but I did clearly see that I needed to figure out what was up and down because nobody else had sort of figured it out. And so I started in the, in the place that I had actually failed years earlier, which was sort of calorie tracking or like food tracking. Um, I had as a model, when you start gaining weight, you get assigned a boxing trainer and a nutritionist. And they had taken me from like 2000 calories over 18, 1500 to 1200 calories at which point my parents took my car keys away because I was not not in a, in a good position to drive. And because I was still gaining weight, I got fired for cheating. So I actually deep down should have known that this was not necessarily going to work. 
but it says something about the desperation that I just needed something that I could sort of count on that I could, you know, measure and calories is a, is a number. And I felt comfortable in that. So I started out journaling and the good thing was that by buying this big caloric intake book, I started paying attention because when you look up everything you eat, you not only see how many calories is in it, you also start, at least I did, start seeing patterns in what you were doing and how it was affecting you. And it became very clear that the journal was not going to take me anywhere. So I turned back to an Excel spreadsheet and I started inserting all of the sort of collecting data into an Excel spreadsheet and building sort of like small algorithms to look at the causality between what I was doing and how it was affecting me. For one, told me that the cardiovascular issues I had were not necessarily what we had believed them to be. And that then in turn gave me sort of the idea that maybe I could get rid of all of it. And so 16 months in total and a lot of sort of fluke accidents and luck um, got me to the place where I was. Um, I And when I say it like that, it's because like I have family in Phoenix and out there it's like a steak is like family size. Everything is big. And I realized that I actually thrive when I eat red meat, which really I shouldn't have with my with my sort of diagnosis pad thinking. And so for a long time, I actually believed that red meat was really just very healthy for me until at some point I figured out that I'm severely allergic to chicken and beef actually is not necessarily good for me. It's just when you eat a lot of beef, you don't eat that much chicken. And so it tells you also a little bit about how much in the initial phases, it was sort of like learning on the job, like trying to, to gain these insights. Um, but what I had not thought about at the time was how much my brain was sort of like the perfect incubation for this project, because I've always seen the world in patterns. And I think that's what it that's what sort of took me to both have the the view on everything in the way that I did, but also believe that this was the the right solution, even when the rest of the world sort of said that chronic diseases do not get reversed in Excel spreadsheets. I think um first of all, I applaud you uh, for waking up and for figuring out and for leveraging your strength for just seeing that you know, looking into patterns. And, you know, you mentioned that it, it was about 16 months before you were really, you had, I guess, accumulated enough data to see enough patterns. But I'm kind of curious. I mean, this might be getting a little down a down a, a path, if you will. But I'm kind of curious, like when you found out you were allergic to chicken, like what was the process of, was that just um, adding and eliminating foods, trying that out for a period of, say, four months, six months? Like how, like, because I would imagine that you were also pulling up and down levers as you're figuring out this data, putting it in, taking it out. What was that experience like? It was actually kind of funny. It was the opening of this, like now it's a big chain, but at the time there was a, a new place called Sweet Greens that opened in DC and I had a salad and everything was like on the wall. They had written with charcoal, like the farms, like everything was like locally sourced and organic and everything. And so there was supposedly nothing in what I ate that would, you know, be contradiction to my diet. And yet I had to leave because I got extremely sick. And when I got home, I took every ingredient of that salad that I had had and ran it through my algorithm and it came up clear as day that chicken was the issue and even though I had been looking at my data and done a lot up until that moment I had never looked for it and so it was actually a monumental moment for more than one reason because it identified that chicken was my trigger but it also showed me that false positives and the way we look at data and so on it needed to be a much larger part of of how I was going to go about it if I was um, going to continue. Um, a good thing for me and for luckily patients after me is that what we found is actually that if you can identify the main trigger 
or the main triggers, sometimes it's two or three that people have, then all of the issues that you've had with food sensitivities and intolerances over your life sort of goes away. And so we see people who've had like allergies to peanuts ever since they were children, all of a sudden being able to eat peanut butter. You, your, your body has been doing something that it didn't work well for it for so long that once you figure out how to sort of recalibrate, then the bandwidth becomes so much larger and all of a sudden you can do a lot of different things. That's so fascinating. And thank you. Thank you for that, for those details, because it's just curious in hearing this, this journey. So, so you figure out after 16 months, you find out how to get your, what was it 16 months that you got yourself into remission? So I actually started being in remission earlier, but it took me 16 months before I normalized my blood work. And as I said, I was a lot of trial and error. What, what it took me 16 months, we do for clients now in 16 weeks. Wow. Wow. So I was just going to get to that. So after 16 months, you normalized your blood work and you saw an opportunity. Like talk about then the timing between that idea, getting healthy, being empowered, having this probably a newfound sense of life, but also the knowledge of being able to affect change for other people. Like what was that moment from then to when you formed Mimi and the process of which, you know, putting you know, putting out the patent and everything. Uh, what was that like? So, so I had just started my last company at the time and was not, this was a very personal journey. So I hadn't really seen it as a business, but it did really buck me that I couldn't get any of my doctors to look at the data. Nobody was interested. And so that was sort of the first point of tension was that I couldn't believe that you get, you know, a diagnosis and you're in the system and you're, you know, medicated. And then when you come back with a solution that at least worked for the end of one yourself, that nobody would even look at it. And so that was sort of the starting point. But then thanks to, you know, the, the world being a mysterious place, I ended up having a friend visit from Denmark who at some point when I was putting something into the computer goes, can I see? And I turned around my computer and he looked at my Excel spreadsheet and he goes, oh, do you want to see mine? And he turned around his computer and we had almost identical self projects at the same time. He was debugging his allergies. I was debugging, you know, my system. And within five minutes, we looked at each other and said, we have to do this. So while we were unwielding this thing, became abundantly clear how far away we were from sort of like the established system and how things were done. In hindsight, I'm so grateful that the two of us at the time decided we're not going to be looking for a commercial model. We're not going to be looking at this the way you normally build a company. We're going to be looking to solve as big of a problem as we possibly can wrangle our arms around and hope if that's possible that there will be somebody willing to pay for that solution once we get to the other side. Whether that was a good idea or a bad idea, we can always discuss. But it allowed for us to really think out of the box and really give time to this iterative process where we continuously were learning. And I think to this day, there's things that we've discovered in this process with patients that have shown us things that is still not known in medical literature uh, but we were kind of in in the early days of this quantified self movement and so that was how it sort of started um i started taking you know friends and family people we met in different sorts of life and sort of be a person personal coach at the time i didn't even you know i didn't have a coach certificate or anything i took that later but really um sort of seeing if I could duplicate what I had done for myself, for others. And so in 2015, it had about 70 people do the process. And at the time, it was clear that we needed to have some data. And so we took 50 lupus patients through what we at that point had built. And we were able to prove out that it actually not only worked, but it worked really pretty damn well. And so... Um, then it was trying to get into the system, right? Um, and the way we did that was literally whenever we saw an autoimmune specialist team release data, we would write them and say, we have this study, 
you know, obviously we are not the experts like you are, but would love for you to take a look and see if there's anything that actually, um, you know, resonates with you. And if you can tell us where we went wrong and those conversations ended up being some of the studies that we later started investigating and looking at. So it wasn't straightforward. It, it, it had a long incubation period. And then in 2017, Mining Inc. was formally founded. Um, we've since done several studies, latest uh, three-year payer study with a large commercial insurer who essentially, uh, you know, became the proof point of Miami not only helping patients with this particularly severe autoimmune segment of rheumatic autoimmune, but also um, showing savings in the area of $37,000 per eligible member. What an interesting journey. And then to go out and I like the fact that you described it being a real iterative process and not feeling that you had to, that you could think out of the box because what you're doing to bring what you're doing, which the way I think about it, not being an, an expert like you is that you're, you're, you're looking at a holistic way of looking at body and treating something and, you know, uh, not to share, but um, I think it was like 10 years ago, I went in for a gynecology appointment and six weeks later, I get a, a call from my gynecologist and she says, you know, your, your numbers look a little funny, your TSH numbers. And I think you might have something to do with your thyroid. She'd probably get it checked out and she's really relaxed about it. And I'm like, well, you know, how long do I have before it becomes a real problem? You know, like, do I have two months? Do I have six? Like, is it early? Like, and she said, oh, six months. Well, you know, I didn't have six months. I mean, had I not gotten it early, I would have. Anyway, long story short, um, the reason why I'm sharing this is, is that the first thing I, so I went to, and met with an endocrinologist. I did not like this doctor, did not like that I was a number. I wasn't looked at or treated or talked to. I was dismissed. But secondly, when I went back to my internist, who's a good friend, I said to him, can I treat this holistically? his words. I remember being on the train ride home and he says, no, you will need to be on medication likely for the rest of your life. Well, guess what? So, so I go to his, his endocrinologist and she says, we have a 30, 30, 30, 33% chance of remission, complete remission, 33% chance it'll come back 33% chance of, I forget what else, but in any case, I've been in remission for about 10 years. Long story short, I was on medication for 18 months. I changed up my diet. I started doing process of elimination, cutting out gluten, all those things. But I think what's interesting in hearing, I mean, I'd love to look at your algorithms. I'm really curious about that. But I, I, I have the same sort of inclination to want to not treat it medically, to want to treat it holistically. And so, so as you created this company, how are you able to are you going and just collecting data? How are you dealing? What's the interface with the patient and that whole experience like? You know, because we are working with severe autoimmune patients who's typically spent five to seven years being dismissed in the system and then a decade and, and more it being seen as a number in, in sort of, and I'm not saying that rheumatologists or specialist doctors are not doing their best. They are. They've just not had the best tools in the world to help people. And so a lot of people have had gruesome journeys. And one of the most important things for us was really meeting people where they were. And every single of our health coaches have reversed autoimmune diseases for themselves through our protocol, um, which means you're not being met by somebody that talks about this in, in any abstraction. This is somebody who you can talk to in your own words, which I think is a very important starting point I always talk about sort of like the hope bank. I think everybody has only so much hope. And if you've seen a multitude of doctors, alternatives, you've tried everything and nothing works, at some point you almost would rather not try something than fail at yet another thing. And so I think one of the really important things is that if you, if you take away from people's hope banks, you have to treat that with an enormous amount of respect. And so for us, it was really important that when people sort of stepped into our universe, that we were very clear about what it would take. 
because it's not for everybody. It's not like I've, I've heard all these testimonials from clients that have gone through my me and they make it sound like this is the easiest thing in the world. And yes, we try and make it, you know, as, as frictionless as possible. But the reality is that it's, they talk about it as easy because they're on the other side of something that's probably the hardest thing they've ever done, which is behavior change. And I think it's important for me in the initial phases to be very clear around, we cannot do a good job if you, for example, are not interested in spending a couple of minutes a day tracking certain moments or if if your profilation is whatever. And I think so for, for us, being true and honest and very clear in the way we communicated so that we didn't actually, um, to the detriment of others, let them go down a path that would leave them not successful. And, um, and that was sort of extremely important for me, having gone through this journey myself. But when that's all said and done, uh, we had a hypothesis, which was that autoimmune diseases had been miscategorized in the sense that if I had, you know, breast cancer and my counterpart had prostate cancer, everybody would know that we had cancer and the mechanism was cancer. With autoimmune disease, everybody talks about it like it's hugely different diseases because some attacks the skin, some attacks the organ systems and so on and so forth. And so it's almost like addressed as if it's not even in the same ball game. And my response would be, well, if I had, you know, breast cancer and I didn't get treatment for seven years, I think it would also spread to other sides of the body. So maybe more so thinking about it as an underlying mechanism. And so for us, triggers really became the obsession. How do we understand what triggers this autoimmune disease more so than where is the body getting attacked? And by changing the focus from where to why, we were able to, in a very succinct way, build a protocolized program that a disease agnostic and to a large extent more takes into account what's your tail, like are you coming in from a respiratory or did you have a gut related or sort of like a cancerous um, fibroid entry point into autoimmune disease might actually play a larger role than your actual diagnosis. And so I think um, what ended up being the program was very much driven by the data. It was driven by the understandings of the people that had been through the program prior to whenever you were a part of the program. And of course, over the years, we got better and better, hence being able to do in 16 weeks what, what originally took 16 months for myself. But I think more so than anything, it was a steadier and steadier hand. Uh, with the first people we said, we'll try our very best to help you the best we can. And now we have, uh, you know, 90 people that complete the program, not 90, 90% of everybody that starts the program finishes it. And we have a higher um, percentage of people that actually have a success going through it. Um, and so now we don't have to be quite as brutal in the beginning around trying to scare people away. But I think it's imperative for me that we help as many women as possible in this stage because it's not just robbing you of your health. It's robbing you of the chance of being the mother, wife, sister, a friend that we all would like to be when, when we are feeling like ourselves. Wow. That's beautifully put. Um, there's so much there. And I think, um, I think one of the things that just hit me that you said, which I think the audience should hear what's really unique about your, your company and how, and the way you're doing your business is really coming at it from each one of you has experienced this. So of course, the notion of, we all love the peer to peer reviews or, you know, when, when someone has been through the same experience, the amount of empathy, not just compassion, but empathy, I have walked in those shoes. So you instantly go into a situation where you're trusting who you're working with, 
you know, and you couldn't be more correct. I mean, behavior change is one of the hardest things in the world. So to have a 90% success rate there, <laughs> that's almost unheard of. So, I mean, they have to come in probably feeling to your point of earlier commenting that the autoimmune diseases that they have are really, um, you know, um, so I, yeah. I severe, thank you. I was looking for that word, but, but so I think that's really interesting because it is a commitment to doing that, but to seeing the other side of it. So if there's 10 of you guys or five of you, and then you have 90 patients who've been through it or, and are on the other side. And I think you're right that a lot of people, when they get on the other side of whatever those pain points are in life, they forget a lot about the journey that it took to get there. So, we, we, I mean, what's interesting is, Matt, you don't seem to. You seem to be, and, and, and that's because you founded a company that's serving this community a certain way, uh, which I think is just remarkable. So how do you see, you know, you, you made the comment about serving and really helping women so that they can show up as, as their best selves in their various aspects of life. How do you, is that, what percentage of your community are women? So autoimmune in in general is eighty percent women, yeah. um, and uh, what we are seeing is generally that women are, are more often than men hit by several, so three to four diagnoses. The 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 sort of severe portion of the autoimmune population that we see have four more diagnoses and are on a multitude of medications. Do we have, you know, both men and women as our clients? Of course. Uh, but I think one of the reasons why it was so imperative for me initially to really focus on women was because of the hormonal aspects. There is something to be said around being sent home, being told it's all in your head that we just have not seen men being subjected to in the same way. They go to the doctor and they get a prescription to go to see a specialist. And that unfortunately have not necessarily been the case for women who show up with like yourself, a thyroid issue. Um, and I think um, we've seen enough drugs now that got cleared on men and given to women and, and not necessarily be, um, be, be quite able to tackle the hormonal aspect. And so autoimmune disease is, is highly impacted by that. And we see women come and say, well, I know exactly it's like three days after my period and they can get very precise around it, but there's not really anything that the standardized way of treating autoimmune patients in the healthcare system today can do about knowing that. We can, because we are sort of looking at people through an enormous um, filter, right? And so a lot of times we are able to help people either decrease their insulin usage or understand what are the foods that you need to take either prior or post or, you know, we have a, some really interesting examples of like Embrel, for example, uh, their old injections were done where there was a little bit of latex in the um, injection mold. And it basically meant that a lot of our patient population would get these rashes around the injections. And so we established that anyone on this specific drugs should lay low on histamine inducing foods prior to um, to getting themselves the injection and we could alleviate them getting the rashes. Uh, I'm sure that they've changed it since, but I mean, all of these small things that are quite a nuisance in your day as you go through this, um, if you can move all these little stones as, as a part of the journey, that also gives people more faith in sort of the fact that there will be a positive outcome. And so for us, it has really been about being able to, in the first 17 days, deliver some tangible outcome that gives you a change in your everyday life. And most of all, because it gives you the belief system that, hey, if I stick to this, I can actually get some measurable impact in my life. I love that. That is so encouraging. I mean, it's the 21 days of, you know, forming habits, but I think to be able to come back with measurable, you know, outcomes to, to be able to tangibilize what they're going to go through, that does give them hope. It does give them belief and it, it gives them trust that, that there is light at the other end. So that's fantastic. So how do you imagine the next, you know, 
three, five years? Where do you see Miami? Where do you see yourself in this journey? So we are actually at the, the junction now where we are going to be acquired by somebody in the next, you know, in 2024, that's uh, the next step on this journey. And many have said, well, you have this amazing data. Why are you not doing it yourself? And healthcare is a funny thing. And I think the journey from like having finished the research into commercialization, I would love for it to be a big player who has already the distribution channels. Um, one of the potential acquirers that we are talking to when asked, you know, where do you see this in five years? Answered without blinking a standard of care. And so, of course, that would be our dream, right? If we could actually accelerate what we did into standard of care, um, mission completed, we can, uh, we can, uh, we can be proud of, of what we did. I mean, that's, that would be massive. That's like scaling something that when we think of autoimmune disease, or when I think about it, I think about this rare disease, as you said earlier in the conversation, it's a long journey to diagnosis. You go through all of these different, you know, treatment modalities or what have you, that doesn't really address the underlying cause, probably more the symptoms. And so to get to the other side, to build all of what you've built and to be able to scale it is just massive. You should, that's amazing, uh, Matt. Congratulations for all of your hard work and for seeing the potential and for recognizing that, you know, maybe going to a larger, you know, being acquired and being able to bring it to the masses is more important than anything because you're going to help so many people around the world. I think it's also fundamentally because we built this to make change. And I think a lot of times founders get so wrapped up in wanting to be the sort of head honcho. But I think we have to all put our ego sort of aside and say, where could this make the most change? And if you are a startup, no matter how much you raise, you're not going to make anything standard of care in a five-year period. You need a bulldog to uh, to be able to make that happen. And I think we've come we've come to a good place, and I look forward to being a part of that journey. So last question, I, I don't want to end this conversation because this is a subject near and dear to me, but I do want to get your perspectives. It's an opportunity for you, Matt, to give a message to women around the world of all ages, of all cultures, and all backgrounds. What do you want to say to women? I think the most important part among women is that women have to lift women. I think we've way too often seen that going into a law firm when there was a female partner was actually less attractive than going into a law firm that didn't have a female partner. That statistic was the most disheartening thing I've ever read. And I think the most important part, whether you take people in as interns or executives, make sure they get a lot smarter while they're with you and that they leave at a different level than when they got in. For me personally, I oftentimes have a little bit of a hardship when people talk in these big, fluffy terms about changing everything in the world. I think it comes down to what can you do on a small scale that can sort of snowball into making a huge change. And I can promise you, if every woman actually lifted all the women around them, the change would already be here. Unfortunately, sometimes... There's a lot of talk, but there's very little action. And I think what Under the Sisterhood and, and a lot of others have, have realized in the last decade is mobilizing the power within and actually unleashing that is going to make a huge change in the world. And so that I'm super passionate about. And I am thankfully surrounded by women who also believe in, in lifting others. And as they say, the rising tide lifts all boats. Exactly. Anything we can do to lift the next woman. And by the way, it, it doesn't take away from us. It adds to us. It makes us better human beings. Thank you so much for sharing your story and for getting under the hood. You are doing remarkable work. You're an extraordinary woman. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for having me. Thanks for listening to Under the Sisterhood. If you haven't already, please give us a quick rating and review on Apple or Spotify. And make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn so you can hear from more amazing women.
This podcast is created and hosted by Under the Sisterhood LLC and Elizabeth Elfenbein, produced by Elizabeth Elfenbein and Matt Butler and edited by Matt Butler. The music is by Ayla Schaefer, her song Rose.